My name is George Carnley. Um, me and my son are now the only ones in George, and I used to be the only one until I got married, of course, and had a son and a daughter. And uh, we all live here in Georgetown. I migrated here from Florida to work at the paper mill, and I worked there for over 40 years. And uh, I retired due to a heart attack that knocked me out of work, and I haven't worked any since, and that was in 77. <clears throat> And I uh, joined the Navy in uh, 1943, in the spring, late spring of 43. And for some reason, and I still can't understand why, I enlisted for six years. <laughs> of course, I went to basic training in Norfolk, Virginia. And from Norfolk, Virginia, they sent me back to Charleston. Well, they had just commissioned a ship in Charleston the day that we arrived in Charleston. We were too late for the commissioning, but it did let us aboard the ship. There was no <coughs> mattresses, no pillows. <coughs> we had to go out to the barracks and rob them to get us a pillow and a mattress. And Carol back picked our bunk out I suppose there was a hundred head of us that came from boot camp to the ship. And uh, we got settled, they didn't have any way to cook, so we had to go out into the Navy yard to find food. They had a cafeteria or something there to feed us with, so that's the way we got fed. Then. We just settled down to doing what we could. They called on us on the <laughs> ship <coughs> to have fire watches where they were welding, put the ship together. And uh, we, I had quite a few fire watches and never had a fire though. And finally they got enough made to fix that they could turn the propellers on it. So it sat there at the dock for weeks with the propeller just slowly turning. And uh, that went on until sometime, I believe it was in the spring. I, my dates are all mixed up. But uh, they got, took it away from the dock, let it float out, to see okay. if it worked right. <laughs> it was a destroyer. <coughs> USS Pringle was made, I can't tell you the number of the dock there in Georgetown, uh, in uh, Charleston, but uh, it floated all right. The propellers turned all right. The steering gear works, so they headed out in the bay. And they cruised around the bay a few times and went back to the dock. After a few trips like that, they settled down and decided to go out in the ocean. Well, we felt pretty good. We were old. We had been on it a month or two, and we were already old sailors. And we went to the ocean, and as soon as we got into the end, the ship began to jump up and down and roll one way or the other. And we were the seasickest bunch of men you ever seen. <laughs> we had a terrible time. We went to try to eat, and <coughs> I believe, we accused the cooks of doing it on purpose, feeding us greasy pork chops. And that didn't help your seasickness. But uh, we finally made the day eating a bunch of saltines, got back in. And after about three weeks of that, it didn't bother us anymore. We enjoyed going out. And I remember we uh, practiced uh, depth charges, uh, shoot them off a the ship, and set them for a certain depth and they'd go off and boy, there was a mushroom come up, you know, it was beautiful. And I can remember seeing some nice spot tail bass floating around after the blast. That went on until we, the ship got pretty well settled. 
We were later assigned our battle stations. I was assigned to a, as a gunner on a 20 millimeter. And I also had a job. They called me up one day <clears throat> and says, come on, get in the truck and go with us. I had no idea what they were doing, but they took me over across Charleston. And we went into a building there that it was a sonar training center where you trained you to teach underwater, search underwater and find objects such as submarines, especially is what it was. So I got into that because they told me to. After a few weeks training there, we went out, to, they let me do it at sea. You, you sit in front of a instrument with a little wheel there, a little knob, and you would turn it, and your signal would go out whichever way you had the wheel turning. That was a kind of a steering gear thing. If it hit an object out there in the water, it would come right back to you. So it was interesting. After we had all our battle maneuvers, what to do if we had a contact, and we were told to go to Norfolk, to Portland, Maine, for our final training lessons. So we went to Portland, Maine, and had about six weeks, I think, of further training. How quick we could get to our battle station and uh, get ready to fire and just regular battle training, you know. We got it down from about four or five minutes, and we cut it down to about two and a half minutes to we could be ready to fire at the enemy. And uh, that satisfied the captain. He thought that was pretty good. While we were in training up there, there was a convoy coming from, coming from England or in that area to America to pick up supplies and whatever and carry it back to our soldiers. <clears throat> and they were being hit daily by a submarine. That submarine would take one out most every day. And uh, they called on us to go find them. Well, we did, we had, had good navigation. We knew where we was going and all that. And uh, we found them, that convoy, and the seas were rough, terrible, mountainous. And I don't know if any of you's ever been to sea or not, but with a mountainous sea, you could be on this ship and another one over there four or five hundred yards away will disappear. He'll go down in a hole. <laughs> As the ocean swells back and forth, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> so we got with them and we started patrolling around them. And uh, evidently the submarines could hear our sonar signal. And they never bothered them again. We got them back safely and uh, without losing another ship. And we were getting low on fuel, so we went into Halifax, Nova Scotia, to refuel. Now, this ship, what I should have probably told you to start with, it had an airplane on this destroyer. And uh, well, we tried to use the airplane. You couldn't do it in rough water. The water had to be good and smooth. But we did get it off a few times, and it patrolled around, <clears throat> experimenting. Finally, when all that was over, we got back to Portland. Our next step was to come back to Charleston. We got, <coughs> <coughs> we got back to Charleston. The first thing they did was take that airplane off. The ship wasn't suitable for one. And they added a two added quad forty millimeter guns where the ship was facing and another five inch thirty eight. They also put quad forties on the front on the uh bow just in front of the bridge on the port and starboard side. And uh, that was our fire 
really best firing guns you ever seen. We finished some more training in Georgetown and uh, Charleston. <laughs> and uh, from Charleston, they sent us out and we went by Cuba and just circled all around and it was peaceful then, maneuvering all the way into the Panama Canal. <clears throat> and uh, we eventually got through the Panama Canal come out and went on to Honolulu. And we spent a few weeks at Honolulu. And uh, from there, there was one of the battleships that was due to go into the Pacific War territory. Well, we escorted it because they were subject to being attacked by submarines that subs like to hit those big ships. But we'd patrol with it and keep the submarine away. If it come close, we'd detect it. So we went on, we got into the war zone. <clears throat> that was at Guadalcanal, way down in the South Pacific. And uh, Guadalcanal had already been conquered by the Americans. The Japs were on the run, but they sent us there anyways. and. Uh, we saw our first enemy planes in that area. One of them flew over so high, they told us about to expect it before we even got in that location, that he'd fly over and drop some bombs, and he'd fly over so high you couldn't reach him with your guns, but he'd drop four or five bombs and you wouldn't see him no more. Miss you, a quarter of a mile maybe. But uh, after working, in that area, we started moving out a little further, and there was a string of islands from Guadalcanal, as a matter of fact, from Guadalcanal all the way up to Japan. It was just island after island, and they were all occupied by the Japanese. Some of them were well fortified. Others, not much on them. <clears throat> but uh, our, become our task to soften up those islands that had uh, Japanese on them, where they had uh, guns that could fire at our ships or at our planes. So we were joined by <clears throat> two or three other destroyers, and we, would, we got to where we called it the slot, kind of an open space going up. <coughs> <coughs> We'd go up and leave about four or five o'clock in the evening for dark, or just as it was turning dark, and we'd run that slot doing 27, 28 to 30 knots, which is up close to 40 miles an hour. And uh, we were looking for enemy gunfire. Well, they never did fire at us much. And uh, so uh, they decided somebody, the big bosses, decided that it was time to start taking the islands back. So <clears throat> they'd get a task force of ships with a, probably a two or three hundred men, soldiers on it. I don't know how many, but it was enough to subdue the island. And then we'd get up and in advance of them, and we'd fire shells on that island for an hour or two after running up the slot. We'd already done it a few times, but when we knew they were going to land on a certain one, we'd, we'd go ahead and, and bombard the beaches and everywhere we thought there could have been a gun. And they'd come on up, and that thing would come up to the beach and let down. The troops would run across, over it, and, Sometimes they would hit pretty heavy fire, and most of the time after we'd softened it up, though, they could go on shore, and the spots they did get fired on, they'd call back to us and tell us where the guns were that was hurting them, and we'd just back off about five miles and lob a shell over and pop it right in that area. We could pinpoint anything. <clears throat> it's amazing how accurate you could do something like that. 
that went on from one island to another. And there was one island that I believe it was Cola, Barga, Cola, I can't say it. <laughs> <coughs> but it had a smoking volcano. And I probably, I don't know, it might still be doing it. But it, it laid down a lot of heavy smoke. And some of it helped us and some of it hindered us. And we kept going from island to island, island to island, and capturing them as we went. And our, our troops uh, captured the enemy or run them off one way or the other. And that went on, and uh, finally we got to an island, Saipan. Uh, Y'all probably heard of that one. <clears throat> Saipan was a pretty good island, and it was well fortified. It had some large caves on it. And the enemy would run up in them caves and they'd run out with a, roll it out and uh, fire at you if you got in range of them. So we had a pretty hard time there. It was awful. The worst thing about it, besides being shot at, was just living because the Japs couldn't stay on the island because we was firing in our Soldiers were on it, running them off. So they were floating all over the ocean out there, dead. And we were close enough in that those blowflies, believe it or not, big old blowflies on the bodies floating around, all around out there, come on the ship. We had a time fighting those blowflies. And I think that's the island they started their planes flying to Japan and further towards Japan and dropping bombs. <clears throat> I know that uh, I remember that we just about dust, a little after dust, the plane them B-17s had come rolling over, going to somewhere to drop bombs. And well, they'd retaliate, they'd come in and they'd drop bombs around us, but they never hit us. We were very fortunate there. So we kept going, island to island, and finally we, I can't, <clears throat> we come into the, trying to get into the Philippines. And we broke into the Philippines and it was pretty, pretty rough job getting in there. Saipan, uh, I, I believe it was Iwo Jima, I'm not sure. But we went there and had a tough time there too. That Mount Sirabastia was a tough place. We'd back off four or five miles and just fire in, right into the caves and every hole we could see on it. I don't see how anybody lived there. But they did and they fought back. <clears throat> and, uh, we was there the first time they raised the flag on it. And it was a terrible, terrible time. I've seen our, th our ships carrying the tanks, little tanks hit the shore and start crawling up to help. <clears throat> and all of a sudden you'd see one of them just blow up. And some would just go this way and some that way where they are just hit with gunfire from the Japs. But they finally got all that over, I think. I know, because we finished enough of that, they sent us to Guam. And we bombarded Guam a few times and it wasn't too hard to take. Our troops went on aboard and had no problem with that too much. Well getting close to the end of it. I've covered a lot of miles, over 200,000 miles already on my ship. And uh, of course after Iwo Jima, come Okinawa. And we got deep into that, bombarding here and bombarding there. And I was there when Ernie Pyle got killed. He was a war reporter, and uh, 
The Japs kept coming in and bombing, coming in and bombing. <clears throat> they had uh, our forces, Navy had sent ships out towards Japan to detect them, planes coming in to bomb Okinawa and radio back so they'd be expecting them. So we were one of the ships that was designated to go out on a picket station, they called it. We'd go out, go way out there and just clean, watch the air, you know, and how radar would scan it. And if we found anything going that way, well, immediately it was radioed to them. That went on for a day or two or longer, and they got tired of us being out there. So they started whacking away at us. Oh, one morning they come in and two or three of them come in at us working from different ways, you know. They meant to get us. So I, if I remember right, we shot down one and another ship that was present. Destroyer was the <clears throat> was the ship that the, that the aircraft carrier ran over outside out of Charleston, you know, and I know the name of that, but I can't see it. Anyway, it was with us, and there was another little boat. I call it a boat. It wasn't over 100 feet long. But it was heavily armed, was with us. We was all firing at them. Well, they went, one of them got up, and while the other one was around down here, he, he come in, zoomed in on us. <coughs> well, he hit, he made a bullseye. He hit right amidships. And uh, it was a terrific explosion. The experts on it has said it was either a 1,000-pound bomb or two 500-pound bombs that plane was carrying. And he went right into our number two stack and went down all the way to the keel, exploded and broke the keel. And when he broke the keel, the ship just broke. Broke right in the middle. And we... Uh, of course, most of us that could got off. I was on a gun with uh, two other men. One of them was a radio man, and the other was a gunnery officer, and I was the gunner with my finger on the trigger. Well, I never could any get that plane. He never did come where I could see him because I was up close to the, on over the bridge, and I couldn't get my gun around at certain angles. Well, <clears throat> the three of us, that thing hit, it, it knocked us cold for a spell. I don't know how long I found myself getting up off the deck. And I looked around and there was my radio woman laying over there on the deck. And I couldn't see the officer that was right there. All of them a lot closer than we three or four are here. <clears throat> and uh, directly the officer come back and he said, we got orders to abandon ship. Well, that fellow that was laid on the deck there, I went over to him and he had a shrapnel up in his leg, way up in there, and he was down, couldn't do nothing. I went over to a little rack where we had morphine for the purpose of helping those that were extremely hurt, hurting badly. And uh, it was all gone, no, no more in it. So I come back to him and I ripped his pants a little more where I could see and he could move his leg. And he says, you go ahead, I'll crawl off. So I did, I got down off, started crawling down the side of the ship. I don't know how I did it, but Somehow I got down, and it, somehow he made it down, too, even him crippled. I don't know how he did it, but uh, we got out in the water. I kidded some. They said, well, what did you do? I said, well, I just stepped out in the water and walked out there about 50 yards, 
And then I sunk down and let my life jacket take care of me. <laughs> we were out <clears throat> probably 75 miles away towards Japan, but <clears throat> we got right between Japan and Okinawa to detect the aircraft that were coming in, and that's why they hit us so hard. But uh, after a while, we settled down out in the water. Nobody was, it was pure quiet out there. One Jap plane started coming towards us. Well, the other destroyer in company with us had been hit too. And their automatic system was knocked out and they had to control their guns by hand, you know, them rollers and things that twist them. And that plane tried to come in to us and that ship fired at them. The bullets wasn't much higher than this ceiling over our head. Now you could hear, but they'd pop out there where that plane was and he turned around and went back. He tried several times to come in, but every time he come in on us, that ship would uh, fire a gun at him. And uh, he, did, he went away and it seemed to me like forever, they say it was over 30, 40 minutes that our aircraft protection come in. They had been tied up in fights with each, with the Japs overhead, but they got loose and come in and took care of that plane that was pestering us. When they did, then the ship that was left, the destroyer and that other small craft, come over and started picking us up. Or well, most of them couldn't get up. The little old rope ladder, it's, it's hard to climb if you're healthy. But uh, <clears throat> they had to go partly down and and pass hand to hand, you know, to get them aboard ship. I finally got to the smaller ship, and the ladder I got about halfway up it, and they reached down and got me and pulled me up. So, in a while, we were all aboard. Saddest thing about it was, though, that some were so scared they couldn't get into water. As the bow of the ship, there was two or three sailors standing there with their hands on the lines. And we shouted, turn loose, jump over, jump over. And uh, they evidently couldn't hear us or was too afraid to move. And, and when the bow of that ship went down, they went right down with it. And the stern went down about the same time. It was broke in the middle, so and some of the most moans and groans was the air escaping from the ship. Uh, so in just a few minutes, the, the uh, experts, I don't know who gave this information, it must have been our captain, said we sank in less than six minutes from the time the bomb exploded. I, I can't agree with that, but that's, what, that's what's on the official report. <clears throat> I, uh, was that a kamikaze? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, we had been hit. We were involved in the uh, taking back MacArthur back to the Philippines, and there was a convoy there of a hundred, at least ships, with him. You know, taking him back with everything he needed, and uh, on the way, we were under heavy attack several times. And one of the kamikazes got in through and hit us on our stern, knocked out a 40 millimeter and a five inch 38 and killed, uh, I think, 11 men with it. Our first encounter with uh, something bad was those islands, those Jap planes would come in and they'd go over one, you know, and dive over one and come down in the valley where you were. And, and we got strafed. They'd come down in our machine gun, you know, just rip you with gunfire. First time that happened, they killed two of our men. And we have a, had a reporter on from some newspaper at that time. And he's got a, had a story to tell. Oh, by the way, this ship, 
USS Pringle is on a, a computer. You can get the history of the ship by looking at ship's history on the computer and to get the story of this particular ship as well as some of the others. And well, after we got picked up, we went to back into to Okinawa or in that area and they put us aboard other ship. There was a hospital ship or two there and they of course carried the wounded to that. And we that, <clears throat> that were able to get around, they uh, put us on another ship. It must have been a troop carrier because we got down in it, there's plenty of bunks, you know. And during the night, when we first got into it, <clears throat> it was kind of scary because they had air raids and you could hear them ships firing. And that, that ship we was on would fire and you feel the jerking and we was expecting a bomb to come through any time. But we made it. It was a tough little ship. And it carried us, I guess uh, over a hundred might have got on the destroyer and the rest of us got on that little ship. And after a few days sitting there in the harbor, we didn't have no clothes <clears throat> except what we had on. I even lost my shoes, my wallet, my handkerchief. I don't know how it all got out of my pocket, but it did. So we were reissued clothes. I don't remember how long we stayed at Okinawa, <clears throat> but they finally put us on a ship homebound, and they treated us like heroes. <laughs> They were the nicest sailors on that ship. I mean, they, anything we wanted, we got that they had. So we had a wonderful trip back to the States. We got back in uh, San Francisco. They put us, put us into the barracks. I, I tell you about long about then, I was pretty well down and out. And, uh, but they kept us somewhere. <clears throat> Seemed to me like a hotel, I'm not sure. But uh, then they started taking us out one by one to go before doctors and see if we were able to keep going. And uh, psychiatrists, I guess, was one of their main purposes. Let them get a hold of us and <clears throat> ask us a bunch of questions and check us out. So, <clears throat> I was pronounced okay. In about a, two or three weeks, they gave us a 30-day survivor's leave. I went home to Florida. Spent my leave there and part of it here in Georgetown. And uh, went back in the, I, as I said, I had enlisted for six years. So I had to go back into service and they, Put me on another, <clears throat> another destroyer. I wound up going back to such places as Guam, and Okinawa, not Okinawa, but uh, Korea. It was before Korea's battle. And uh, after a few months, I began to feel all right. I began to enjoy the Navy. The ship that I got on, well, they, they took me on that ship and uh, put me back on an island, Treasure Island in uh, San Francisco, between San Francisco and Oakland. <clears throat> and uh, I stayed there a while and they decided to move me again. And this time they moved me to Guam. That was... <laughs> I looked around, I couldn't see any evidence of where we had done any damage much. <clears throat> but they still had some wild Japanese on it. And uh, hid out in the hills and the caves. It's a pretty rough island. And uh, I was the 
adventurous type of guy. I always fished and hunted and loved the woods. So me and another one that friend decided we wanted to scour around and go over the island and they wouldn't let us go without each one of us strapping a 45 on our hips because there were still so many Japanese loose on the island. But we got by the Japanese it didn't happen when I was there, but just before I got there, they said they'd get way back up and shoot into the chow lines down. The men get in line to go to eat. And uh, they never did hit anybody, I don't suppose, but the bullets would sing around and went over them and hit the dirt or a building or something. <clears throat> that finally ended. Of course, you know the story of uh, the one that didn't know the war was over and they captured him. There's a big story about that. Y'all probably know about that. But from Guam, I got tired of Guam. I was used to a destroyer and moving around. So I went to the executive officer. I could see three or four destroyers anchored out from the island. I asked him if he cared if I went out there and see if one of them would take me aboard. No, he says, uh, go ahead. If they have a place for you, stay with them. So I went out there, and I, the first one I got on said, yes, we need a sonar man. <clears throat> so I went back and told the executive over, and they got all my, my goods and my papers and went back, and I was assigned to that ship. And uh, it wasn't long before it went back to the States. After going to Korea, to cruising around Korea, went back to the States. And uh, they sent me to school. First thing they did was send me to Fleet Sonar School in San Diego. I completed that course six months which made me a uh, qualified maintenance, repair, and operational man on that equipment. And I began to work. I got my <clears throat> studying for advancement. And I finally, I made the first class petty officer in, oh, I believe it was 47 or something. But the day we sank was April the 16th. That was the end of the Pringle, April the 16th. After I went to school, I was assigned to another destroyer. And I worked with it until it come in. I think they might have been retiring some of those destroyers by then. But I stayed in the Navy until the end of my career. I was eligible for chief. They tried to get me to stay in and say, oh, you're going to be chief. You just stay in here and next week you'll be chief. But I couldn't do that. I was in love with a South Carolina girl and I had to come home. <laughs> so we did. I come home and uh, we got married. 1950, we got married. Settled down. And, but... To top it all off, my wife was pregnant, about five, six months pregnant. And I heard a knock on the door one day. And I went to the door, and there was a man handed me an envelope and said, Here, I want you to sign this to be sure that you got it. So I signed it. I opened it up and looked at it, and then it was a bus ticket. And, uh, command to report in Columbia, a naval station or something up there, I don't remember what it was, but I had to go and report. And they put me right back in the Navy. But this time I fared a little better. I went to, uh, they sent me to Norfolk. I went through a, <clears throat> another school, instructor school. 
And then from instructor school, they sent me to Key West where they had a fleet sonar school. And there I uh, spent the rest of the time at teaching and instructing at that fleet sonar school. Meanwhile, my wife was getting bigger all the time. And uh, one day I got the message through the Red Cross to come home. It was to be delivered. So I, <laughs> Key West, you know, where are way out. You can't go in and out of it when you want to unless you got your own car. And uh, I got into town. I caught a bus, got to Miami, caught a bus and got to Charleston. I had to lay over there for a half a day, half a night, and uh, come on home the next day sometime. And when I got to the hospital, my baby was laying up there on the <laughs> in his bed. Cute little fella, and now he's a junior, George Jr. Works at the paper mill. So finally they sent me my discharge. <laughs> I was in, in the inactive reserves. I wasn't supposed to be bothered. They told me, they said, before, before you'll be bothered, every Naval Reserve person in your town will be called before you. And here I was, they bounced me, and all the rest of the Naval Reserve was still sitting here in Georgetown. <laughs> My survivors leave, that's when we got close. I've been knowing her for a while, but uh, come home that survivors leave, we kind of sewed it up. And so I just washed myself on out the rest of the time. And, headed straight home and still waited a year and a half or longer to get married. <laughs> Everything worked out just fine. I was in uh, Miami, still in the service. They had sent me down there and I was staying in a hotel in Miami when I first heard about it. In fact, I was there when they dropped that one in Japan. When they dropped both of them, I was in Miami. And, uh, you know, I, I'm so different, I guess, from most everybody else, from my experiences. I was downtown, and everybody was just shouting and just having a big time because the war was over. I turned around and went to my hotel and I got up in my bed and, and I actually cried. It's a probably a crazy thing to have happened, but it relieved me. I, I was so relieved. While I was in Miami, I was on the honor guard. I guess that's what you might call it. When you go to a funeral and fire the guns, they put me on the honor guard and I had a lot of shore patrol duty that I didn't like. I didn't mind the honor guard, but uh, I didn't like going downtown and having to chase servicemen around out of a bar or something, you know. I didn't like that part. But all went well. I'm happy that things went as they did and I'm still here. I can look back now and see where he's interfered in my life and put me places that I needed to go and kept him from going places that I wanted to go and he wouldn't let me. So I'm so happy about all that now. I do believe that prayers are something special. My daddy was a praying man and I believe through his prayers kept me through the war. It was two or three times I had a wonderful opportunity to kill people. And I couldn't hit them with my gun. It wasn't me. I was aiming the way it's supposed to be, but didn't have contact. Then one night, intelligence informed us of a little Japanese convoy 
carrying supplies and things up a canal like place next to the mainland in the Pacific. So we were detailed, us and another destroyer, to investigate that and see what we could find. So we sneaked through them little islands. We, of course, we had maps. We knew everything about it. And the reason I'm talking to say we, I spent most of my time on the bridge in, uh, as a sonar one and as a person working in CIC. We eased, eased into towards that canal. And the first thing when we got into it, the radar detected a moving object about a mile away to our port, and uh, <laughs> they tracked it enough to know that it was, was, was not another little island. So they opened fire on it. And the first blast, the two ships were coordinated, you know, they both fired right quick, followed by two or three more salvos. And uh, when that thing exploded, just a huge ball of flame, you know, well, that lit us up, and to our starboard side, which we were unaware of, was uh, several smaller ships. And they figured it was one or two gunboats in it, small gunboats. Well, when they, when they fired up that flame over there, and, and we were right between that flame and those ships, and it just silhouetted us, you know, just set us right up. Those little little boats or whatever they were opened fire, and man, them tracers were flying out here. One of them looked like it's going to hit you, but those tracers were coming and going. So I was a gunner at that time on a 20 millimeter, and uh, well, the only thing I could do was put bullets right back in the same spot they were coming from. So that battle didn't last over 30 minutes, because me and three or four other 20-millimeter gunners was poking tracers right back into that same spot. And I'm sure everybody in that boat was killed because it, it quit just as sudden as it started. When we got poured all of our fire into it, that ended it. So I'm sure that the, probably a good number of Japs killed at that time. Anyway, we slipped on out, got back out, went back to where we were supposed to. We did stop that flow of supplies going to some other stations for the Japanese. As we were leaving, I told you we went by Honolulu, the Arizona was still smoking. And that was a beauteous land and I ever seen up there, I thought, I was an old, had a little, worked on a little farm all my life. But I looked up on the side of that hill and going into Pearl Harbor from Honolulu, and I seen perfect straight rows and rows and rows, you know. And I couldn't figure out, I got to asking people what it was, and they said, oh, that's pineapples. <laughs> and they had a, I don't know if y'all ever been there or not, but uh, they had a, a water fountain at uh, one of them places, I don't remember. It, you'd go up there and drink water, and instead of water, you'd get pineapple juice. Well, I'm proud. I don't feel like uh, I'm any different from anybody else. I don't deserve any special favors. I feel like I did my duty, and I'm happy that I did. I can always say that I serve my country and I'm proud of it.